Do you want to make a difference in the world? And see the lives of the people of India and all internationals transformed with the gospel? As India goes, all Asia will go with it. Living the Dream podcast provides tools for you to pray, give, and go as you become an active participant in the Great Commission and help your church's demographic represent the demographic of your community. Get ready to find your strategy for reaching your community and changing the world here at Living the Dream Podcast with your host, Pastor Kevin. Good morning. I'm Pastor Kevin, founder and executive director of Global Hope India and your host for Living the Dream Podcast. This is where the church gathers to mobilize in order to effectively reach the community and change the world, including all the foreign-born internationals moving into our communities. I interview today's top church leaders from around the world so we can learn all we can about reaching internationals with the gospel and partnering with them in the Great Commission. It's time the church has this conversation. Go to globalhopeindia.org forward slash resources for tools for your success. Now let's jump into today's show. I'm incredibly excited to introduce to you my friend Isa from Taiwan. Wait until you hear this episode. You are going to be wondering how on earth did Pastor Kevin get to be friends with Isa. Isa is a native of Taiwan. He grew up in Missouri. He lived in California, but he moved to North Carolina in 2007. As part of his job with SAS Institute in Cary, North Carolina, Isa has been the SAS liaison to the United Nations, where he works with a task force on their 18 global goals. Isa is the program manager for SAS's Data for Good projects. Isa is a pastor's kid. His parents are serving right now as missionaries in China in the midst of the coronavirus. Our thoughts and our prayers are with them as they share the hope of Jesus in the midst of real human need. Isa and his wife have five children. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering and a bachelor's of science from Cornell University in New York. In York. In addition to his corporate life, Isa also pastors the Steadfast Bible Fellowship, a home church in Cary, North Carolina. He and his family are working to build a family house that they've been working on every weekend for three years, swinging the hammers to build this house. Isa says he would travel the world just to eat and collect musical instruments. Will you please join me in welcoming my friend Isa to Live in the Dream podcast? Excited for today's episode. Yeah, thanks. That's so kind of you. Yeah. So you were born in Taiwan? That's right. Made in Taiwan. Yes. <laughs> you have a tattoo? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, you know, I've always thought about it, but I'm, I'm too much of a wimp. I, I can't uh, take that pain. So yeah. maybe just a t-shirt is yeah. kind of what I'm hoping for. As our listeners know, we champion the opportunity in front of the body of Christ to reach the foreign born internationals. Now you hold an American passport. You went through your immigrations and became a U.S. citizen. That's you right. Were sharing when you were in high school. Yeah. But back us up. Born in Taiwan. Tell us how you got to Cary, North Carolina in 2020. Boy. So, yeah, it's funny because here in North Carolina, sometimes I get the, hey, where are you from? I'm like, well, do you want the short version or the long version? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll give you the slightly long version. But uh, yeah, born in Taiwan, came to America when I was five. And actually, by way of Argentina for nine months, landed in Chicago, uh, did, did my first five years in the States in New York City. So, mm-hmm. so got to... You were up in the Big Apple there, and that was fun and interesting. You know, I think I was more street smart at the age of nine than than I have been all my life. You mm-hmm. know, just walking the streets of New York, and then my family moved to Missouri, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's where I did the rest of my growing up. And it was while I was in Missouri and in high school that uh, that I was naturalized as an American citizen. New York to uh, Missouri. That must have been less than exciting for you. <laughs> it, it was such a culture shock. Yeah. Right. Because when I moved to Missouri. People would, you know, leave their doors unlocked or pull up at the store and leave the car running. And I just couldn't help but think like in New York, your car wouldn't be here <laughs> yeah. when you got out. What are you doing? Right. So now you're married. 
You have five beautiful children. Tell us about your family. Oh man. Yeah. It's such a, it's the best job in the world, you know, mm -hmm. parenthood. And, uh, it's also my discipleship program, mm -hmm. you know, and, yeah. and, uh, somebody said to me when we pregnant with our first child, that you will learn so much about God, the father yeah. by being a father yourself. And it has been so true. You know, I still, I still see myself growing up with my, with my oldest, you mm -hmm. know, we're growing up at the same time. Yeah. So I have one boy, he's the oldest and, uh, and four girls below that. So okay. the oldest is almost 17. The youngest just turned seven. 10 year span. Yeah. Five kids. Praise God. How did you and your wife meet? And uh, is she from Taiwan? American? No, no. So she is American. In fact, her, her ancestry goes back to uh, some of the first people off the Mayflower. Oh, right. Wow. So yeah, in fact, funny story. I think her ancestor was John Billington, Billingsworth, but okay. he was the first man hung on American soil for stealing a horse. And uh, his oh, sons wow. almost blew up the Mayflower by playing with, with matches or something in the powder room. So it's oh, actually wow. in some of the history books. It's kind of funny. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we met in college. I went to school in upstate New York and, uh, and she went to college in Massachusetts and I did a lot of singing in college. And so we met her at her school. One of the times we, we were just touring the area singing and mm -hmm. became friends. And it was one of those, you know, I had one of those moments where I just thought this was somebody I'd meet. Smitten went, at first sight? You know, like, yeah, attracted at first sight. But it was like, you know what? I've got my whole life ahead of me. But yeah. there was something in an interaction that made me stop and pause and think, you know what, Lord, why did you do that? Mm -hmm. Am I going to, is there something more here? And now you fast forward 25 years, five kids mm -hmm. later, it's like, yeah, clearly God knew. But yeah, I remember that moment because, you know, when you're, when you're that age, you don't think about the future that much. But I, the Lord just had me pause at that mm -hmm. moment and thought. Mm. Mm. So from touring with a singing group, you, you see her yeah. you then leave from then until marriage altar. How, how many years or how long was it until you? Yeah, great question. Let's see. I went back to Missouri. She went mm -hmm. back to California after uh, graduating college. And I guess it was only about three years, four years. Okay. Um, from the time we met to the time we got married. Right. Well, congratulations on a beautiful family. And for a witness of being a kingdom builder, even as a parent and a discipler as a parent. Yeah, it's, uh, I love it. I mean, you know, God continues to just stretch my boundaries as a parent. And, uh, and then just when you think you've got this stage figured out, you step into the next stage. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, now I got to redo everything all over again. Okay, Lord. Yeah. And, and to be honest, my, my parents are missionaries in China right now. And okay. when we came to America, living in New York City, like I was telling you, and my, looking back, my parents had multiple jobs. My mom worked in a sweatshop. Now that I look back on it, it's like, huh, dimly lit factory selling garments for, for high end stores for three bucks a pop and fights breaking out amongst the ladies. That's a sweatshop. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but, you know, you, you didn't realize it as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so all that just to say they weren't around a lot. I know that they love me, but they just weren't around a lot. And so a lot of my parenting is kind of happening by maps and gauges. Mm -hmm. Right. Coming straight out of the word of God. Yeah. Because I just didn't see. That the, the kind of engaged parenting modeled, you know, mm -hmm. you just couldn't try yeah. to put food on the table. Well, I also uh, value your wife's connection with the Mayflower because it's a friendly reminder. You know, we're in 2020 and we're in a day where we think we have always been in America and, all, and America has always been here. I talked to business people and friends and church leaders over in India and they're like, isn't America a land of immigrants, you're only 200 years old. You know, there's buildings in Mumbai, India, a lot older than America is. And we forget our heritage and that we're really, according to world history, we are a relatively young country. Now we have statistics that 13 plus percent are foreign born internationals living in the U.S., millions of people. And we, we act as if that's very different, but your wife's relatives came over established in America on the Mayflower. Well, and, and, and what I do at work, I've worked with the United Nations for about 12 years as well. And the folks at the UN, you know, they, they point out that one in eight people in the world are migrants, people mm -hmm. born in a different country than where they are working. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's, wow. a, that's a big number. That is on the move. Yeah. And it's healthy for us to realize that. 
because unfortunately, even immigrations, we're not a political show. We're not going to go there, but immigrations has a bad rap right now. There's, there's just a, a bad overtone of, of the word immigrations. We specifically use foreign born internationals just to steer away from some of that bias and, uh, and that. And yeah, I mean, there's, there's a problem of, of any part of uh, society being a burden unnecessarily to a culture. But the word of God makes it very clear that we are to welcome the foreigners. We are to be a friend to the foreigners. I'm not hearing that message. We have this opportunity, but I'm not hearing that message in the body of Christ. And so we're going to get to that message and just any passions the Lord has put in your heart. Let's now just go to your your corporate life. You mentioned the United Nations. You're employed at SATS now. You are their program manager for data uh, for goods projects. Mm-hmm. Um, what what do you get to do there? Gosh, you know, I, I, I give thanks for my job every day. I mean, I get to use the technology that uh, that the company puts out on, you know, and it's technology used by all the governments and big companies of the world to mine mm-hmm. huge amounts of data and, and make decisions off of that. I get to use our technologies to help people and you know, nonprofit organizations, good causes, those that are uh, working towards the, the United Nations has these uh, 17 goals mm-hmm. called the global goals that all the countries of the UN have agreed to as, as targets, you know, and, and these are simple goals that, that I think everyone can get behind around no poverty, education for all, you know, gender equality, mm-hmm. you know, protecting the earth, that kind of thing. And so we bring our analytic resources and people alongside amazing causes who are, who are working towards making the world a better place. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we just try to help them with the important work that they do by, by giving them insights out of their data yeah. and doing some analysis for them that they otherwise don't have time for or couldn't afford. Most nonprofits can't afford a, a PhD statistician on staff just to answer questions for them. Right. But, so, so I get to help and, and, and pray over some of these projects. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's, it's a wonderful opportunity. I know one example, I, want, I welcome you to share others, but I'd love for you just to describe the Nepal project. Nepal had a severe earthquake weeks before winter. Thousands of people are displaced out of their home. And the threat of death is in front of, of the country of Nepal. Either we get a roof over their heads before winter or many thousands are going to perish. And the UN and SAS partnered together on a project. Yeah, and that was a, a really, that was a God thing. You know, where I'd been working with the UN for years and helping them in a different way. Mm -hmm. And when the Nepal earthquake happened, I said, great, Ace, send me your data and let me answer those questions for you and give you insights like we did, you know, in the Philippines when Mm -hmm. when the typhoon Haiyan displaced 300,000 people. And Mm -hmm. but in Nepal, my contact just said, you know what, you can't help me this time. He said, I don't have any data for the problem I'm trying to solve, which is getting sheet metal roofing over people's heads. You know, they had 46,000 families sleeping in open fields because the earthquake was kept yeah and the aftershocks of the earthquake mm-hmm. kept bringing bricks down on people's heads and you know so these people were all in the fields and they said yeah monsoon season's coming and you know hard rains fierce winds and the only thing worse than that at the end of monsoon season are the snow mm-hmm. that comes there at the base of mount everest i had just finished a project with the united nations trade division where 300 million rows of data of everything ever bought and sold in the world was just sitting there and mm-hmm. i just i just happened to be the guy in the seat and, mm. you know, with a few clicks of the mouse, I was mm-hmm. able to say, you know what? India right next door has is the largest exporter of that exact product you need. Mm-hmm. And But then I said, wait, you know, according to the data, Nepal ranks seventh in the world as a large exporter. So do not bring in all this international mm-hmm. international sheet metal that can flood their markets. because mm-hmm. Now you're going to create a second disaster, mm-hmm. you know, and, and ruin their yeah. ability to recover. So it felt good to be used by the Lord, to be the one that brought some insights and answers by which the UN took action on, immediate action on, and they were able to get Mm -hmm. roofing over people's heads by the first day of monsoon season. Well, thank you so much for sharing those examples. And it just helps give some visualization to the opportunities God's putting right in front of you. And glory to him that he puts you in the seat that he has you in. Yeah, praise God. And and when I speak to young people through my work or, or anybody, I just I just encourage them to, yeah, you have your day job. That's great. But also look around you because the unique sets of skills and resources and problems that God puts in front of you and your unique perspective and experiences and approach to that problem 
that, that, that that's that's what innovation means. You're just mm-hmm. approaching a problem in a different way. And, and mm-hmm. each one of us has that unique perspective and set of experiences that we can bring. And so as we think about foreign born uh, nationals and, mm-hmm. and, and trying to integrate them into the church, you know, just I think I love this podcast and just being aware of that because mm-hmm. you know, it's so easy just to go through from week to week, Sunday to Sunday and just not think about, OK, how do we include this mm-hmm. larger population of folks who are steadily coming in and need the Lord every minute as much as we do, right? So let's dive into that because Revelation 7, 9 through 12 gives us that dream, that vision, that reality of heaven where countless seas of people can be seen before the throne of Christ. All proclaiming salvation belongs to the Lord, praising Jesus. But it says every nation, every tribe, every tongue is represented there. My heritage is I grew up in an all-white church. I've been uh, half a century now in the United States, and there's been incredible progress of diversity with the mix between blacks and whites. And I'm pretty sure most Americans will be prepared that when they get to heaven, they're going to see whites, they're going to see blacks. And I'm sure even mentally, we're prepared to see internationals. But now in our neighborhoods, the marketplaces are are international. Schools are international. Corporate America is international. And yet when you go to churches in America, very few are international. And so let the church be on earth as it is in heaven. I'd love to just hear any observations that you've had. You were born in Taiwan. You've now lived most of your life in the USA. What has been your your observations? What are you seeing God do? We are seeing God bring foreign-born internationals absent to the gospel from some of the countries that are most closed off to the gospel. They're coming to the U.S. and they are in a place of vulnerability where they are actually now open to the gospel, exposed to the gospel, and they are finding Christ, taking Jesus only for salvation and becoming ambassadors for for the gospel. We've interviewed several on our podcast already, and we're going to have hundreds more in the years to come that we're going to champion their story. What are you seeing God do? To be honest, I haven't specifically thought about, okay, I haven't specifically been aware of, okay, there are all these foreign-born internationals coming in. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is what I'm seeing in the church, and, and, and I, you know, when we moved to North Carolina 13 years ago, you know, God made it clear for us to go to this one church, and this one church was one of the few churches that I, I've been to in my life where you can look across the whole audience and you, you kind of got a glimpse of what heaven might be like. And that was mm-hmm. fantastic. And then about three years ago, the Lord then called us out of the only church home we knew in North Carolina. And it was one of those moments where God tells you to do something, just tells you to come out, step aside for a second, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to give you the next step. So, you know, God has us mm-hmm. in holding pattern and I'm praying and I got the best advice from a pastor friend of mine who just said, Isa, before you go seeking what God wants you to do, like the next steps, first, you've, you, the prayer that you need to pray is, God, whatever you want, whatever you want, Lord, I'm willing to do it. Then follow up with, okay, Lord, what's the next step? Mm-hmm. And I hadn't really thought to pray that way. It wasn't until I prayed that and I got myself to a point where I was willing to consider anything because I was just looking for another church I could take my family mm-hmm. to and, and, and park every Sunday and continue to get fed. And, you know, life's hard enough trying to just focus on keeping yourself straight and keeping your family straight. Mm-hmm. But it was at that moment when, when the Lord said, hey, what would you think about opening up your home and starting a home church? And to be honest, Kevin, I wrestled with that because, mm-hmm. you know, I have this I have a dream job. I have a wonderful job, wonderful company, wonderful benefits. And the Lord just asks me to open my home. But immediately in my mind. I've already teleported us into the bush of Africa without health care for my, you know, five mm-hmm. kids. And it's like, OK. Uh-huh. And that's not what the Lord was asking. But he was saying, if I asked you, would you? Mm-hmm. Right. And, and I wrestled with that for a couple of weeks. And mm-hmm. finally, I just I remember just being in my car, taking the dog to the vet and just crying, mm-hmm. right? you know, in the car and saying, Lord, why is this so hard for me? Mm-hmm. If I trust you and love you as much as I proclaim that I do to mm-hmm. everybody at church, mm-hmm. this shouldn't be that difficult. Mm-hmm. So, Lord, uh, all right, if you ask, I'll do it. 
So he hasn't called us into the bush yet, but we, so it's been three years now and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and the Lord just said, okay, just keep your doors open and teach mm-hmm. the word. And, and, and he has brought people and, and different people of different races and different backgrounds. Like it's, mm-hmm. it's been great. It's a small, intimate gathering. Mm-hmm. So back to your question about what is God asking? What am I seeing both in a huge multicultural church setting and then in, in the small, intimate church home and just, in, you know, there are other ministries that we're involved in. Uh, locally, seeing God ask people to step beyond just being believers. Yeah. Right. And I'm not coining this, but I've heard it somewhere where God's saying, okay, it's, it's, you need to be more than just, just believe that I'm the way to heaven. Like mm-hmm. I'm looking for people who will, who will elevate me to the true position of Lord, where you're willing to do anything I ask. Yeah. And I've seen it firsthand over and over a lot more lately where, you know, sadly, you see Christians behaving badly. You see Christians choosing to not do what they know the Lord is asking them to do. Mm-hmm. And it just reminds me of that rich young ruler story, mm-hmm. right? He's like, yeah. Lord, what do I need to do? And Jesus lists it out. He's like, yeah, I've done it all. He's like, there's one more thing. Like, you know, mm-hmm. God doesn't want to be second fiddle to, right. to anything. Right. And that's something I've had to walk out in my life and try to encourage as many people as I can to walk that out. Because it's only when you get to that place of complete trust and complete abandon. It was so liberating. Like I struggled, as I mentioned, mm-hmm. I'm crying in my car and I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to give up my cush job and, mm-hmm. and this, this comfortable lifestyle that I have, Lord. But you know what? I would rather be where I got to the point where I would rather be where God wants me and where God is than in comforts of yeah. what i know right better is one day in your courts yeah than a thousand elsewhere yeah easy to say easy to sing mm-hmm. but just coming to that place i really appreciate you breaking that down for us i'm hearing you give a witness to just accepting a period of transition and i re- i'm reminded of abraham's blessing god said i will bless you and i will make you a blessing And what you're testifying to is that you're shifting from that place of blessing in gratitude to what God has done in blessing you. You're allowing him to put you in the process of he is now going to make you a blessing. Not that you haven't been a blessing previously, but I just I just believe you haven't even seen what God's about to do in you and through you to be a blessing to the nations because I can just. Here, and I I know uh, your story, there's just such a spirit of generosity and what you're describing is courage. You're just willing to take courage to abandon certain things and surrender certain things in in order for the sake of the call. And it doesn't necessarily mean you've got to resign. It just means you've got to reposition and you're doing that as living missionally, uh, living as one cent. Yeah. And, And being willing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. willing if God asks. Will you invite us into your story of faith? When did you actually become a believer? Sounds like a young child. Yeah, I've been around the church all my life. My dad was a pastor Mm -hmm. and now they're missionaries in China. So I'm I'm a preacher's kid. And so, you know, I went through a rough spell where I was kind of the the kid at the parties in seventh grade where where everybody came to see what, what kind of alcoholic drink I snuck around. I had my rebellious years for sure, but I am walking proof of that proverb that says train up a child in the way that he should go mm-hmm. and when he is old he will not depart mm-hmm. so i mentioned you know you asked earlier about my wife and we had met and when things got serious with her and i thought i might be interested in marrying this girl something in me switched kevin and i was like a homing pigeon I'm like, okay well if i'm gonna get if i'm gonna get married to this lady then i better get right with god and i better find somebody who'll get right with god with me is mm-hmm. she on board or not because we're gonna have kids and they're gonna live forever and you know and all these things all these truths you know all these seeds that were planted in me so faithfully by others the lord just said okay now's the time to bear fruit and that really was was my awakening and at that point too was when i found a bible teaching church and for the first time in my life i'm reading through the bible like a novel like mm-hmm. I just couldn't get enough, yeah. you know, and, and, and th- these are stories I've heard all my life, but the Lord is just bringing new details and new facets about him and truths about him, right? It's the living word. You can't mm-hmm. outgrow it. You can't drink too deeply from it and ever be satisfied. And that was uh, right before we got married. So 20 years ago now. Wow. Praise God. What about your parents witness? Uh, did they come to the U S as missionaries, as church planners? 
No, not as church planners. But okay. I, I think they, were they were believers. Just, they were believers and they were just, as I understand it and as I remember it, they're just trying to find a better life for us because I'm okay. the youngest of four children. Okay. You know, and my dad's name, Chinese, most people in the world, their names have meanings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, my dad's name means God will provide. Uh, and that's how he's lived his life. We came to America and, you know, they had to work hard, multiple jobs at times, like I mentioned before. But yeah, they came to America to to seek a better life. And now I'm watching the Lord just continue to. So they stepped into the mission field about 20 years ago. You know, it's like a second career for mm-hmm. them. And, the, and and I've watched the Lord in that time continue to develop new skills. So my mom in that time, the Lord gifted her with the gift of healing. And, you know, my parents collectively have been in the ministry for 50 years and God waited until the 30th year mm-hmm. of them being in ministry to say, hey, Here's something new you can try yeah. for my glory. What do Let you me think? trust you with this. <laughs> yeah. He says, those who are found trustworthy with uh, small will be given more. So they're in China right now with coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And, and so I just talked to them last mm-hmm. week. And, you know, it's mm-hmm. that peace that passes understanding. I, I mm-hmm. hear it in their voice. They're not worried. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but yeah, so just thinking about where they are and, and what they've seen in the last 10 years in China alone. Yeah. They've seen that government get more and more strict and anti-church, anti Jesus. And but that is a incredible example of what this podcast is all about. That vision of coming absent. Now they weren't absent to the gospel, but they are faithful ambassadors for the gospel. And you are an ambassador for the gospel. And that's one of the things I really pray over the church in America that we would realize how much uh, yes, we might perceive that foreign-born internationals need us, but we need them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some incredible, faithful people of faith of the Lord Jesus that have been born in other soils that God is bringing here to strengthen us. That's right. We interviewed Io just a few weeks ago about survival faith, and he grew up in Nigeria witnessing survival faith. And then he came here. And one of the things he realized is the church here doesn't have to depend on God the way that the church in Nigeria had to depend on God. And so I'm like, Io, we need you. When there's a call to worship, foreign born internationals are so much faster to enter into worship. When there's a call to pray, foreign born internationals are so much faster to get on their knees. And really, I mean, we're not just talking about little warm, fuzzy prayers anymore. We're talking about shaking the gates of hell prayers, really dreaming that, uh, desiring that for the body of Christ in America to just have those passions that God is injecting into his, his people around the world to strengthen the church here. You know, and and they have an appreciation for the Lord, Mm -hmm. to your point, that we just don't have. You know, we've become too comfortable. There are lots of different lots of different terms for that. And so this coming summer was interesting. Last November I called my wife just to say hello um, from work one day and she said, You know what? I think this needs to be the year that we send our son abroad on a missions trip alone. Mm -hmm. And I just paused on the phone Mm -hmm. and I thought, This is so crazy because I just had that same thought today. And prior to that night, it was just a thought out of the blue. Wow. But that was the Lord bringing us together because, mm-hmm. you know, raising raising teenagers, mm-hmm. right? And trying to keep them from going wayward. And what, what I was realizing was that, you know what, he hasn't known hardship. Hardship for, for him is not having Wi-Fi for a few hours, yeah. right? Like in this Cush mm-hmm. American lifestyle, you've just not seen enough hardship right. in, in his life. or, or and, and not that you need to go to another country to find it. There's plenty of hardship around, but mm-hmm. you know, for he himself, he just hasn't seen enough of it. And so we're going to send him away to, uh, to, to the Philippines for a month this summer mm-hmm. Crazy to God. work at an all-boy orphanage so mm-hmm. that he can see like, okay, yeah. this is why the world needs Jesus. Mm-hmm. This is why I need Jesus. From the mission field. It's very common in India. You go into a rural village, you don't speak the local language, the villagers do not know English, and one after another, you will find uh, people, especially in, in the church, when they know that you are a person that you can trust and that you're kind and you're loving, they're, they're very eager to come and talk to you. And They insist upon talking in their local language that you do not understand. And you can sit there and try your best to say, I do not know your language. Uh, I only know English. 
and yet they continue to talk and everyone around you, the team members just begin to uh, smile. And after you get back on the bus, you have a nice laugh about that elderly woman or that elderly man that just went on and on and on, convinced that you could understand and yet you didn't know a word that they were saying. We want to give some local love to our friends at Selling to Give. They align their profession of serving clients, buying or selling a home with their passion to impact and transform lives. They donate the first fruit of every home sold through their Selling to Give Foundation to support local and global ministries. We salute David and Amanda Williams from Selling to Give for their generosity and gospel impact. Check out their website at sellingtogive.com. Global Hope India empowers the church in India through multiple channels. One of the most influential methods has proven to be sending individuals on short-term trips to India. During your 10 days in India, you will make a difference, be the hands and feet of Jesus, and see the lives of Indian internationals transformed by the gospel. We have opportunities in children's ministry, women's ministry, job training, medical missions, and more. Experience a life-changing adventure. If you're looking to make an impact, India is the place and GHI is the opportunity. See our trips at globalhopeindia.org forward slash go. Know your numbers. Maybe you've seen the show Shark Tank and you've seen the business owners come in to pitch to the sharks and explain why they're the right person to execute the vision for their business. Well, we believe that you are the right person to execute the vision for your church and you need to know your numbers. I want you to remember as we talk about know your numbers, we're talking about know the number of souls that Almighty God has created and loved and sent his son to die for. Let's talk about the ethnic groups. There's five major ethnic groups. The first is whites. 70% of whites identify themselves as Christians. 79% of blacks identify themselves as Christians. Only 34% of Asians. This is 4.6 billion Asians on planet Earth. Only 34% identify themselves as Christian. 77% of Latinos identify themselves as Christian. And mixed ethnic groups, 64% of them identify themselves as Christian. Christ is being made known among the whites, among the blacks, among the Latinos, and among the mixed but it is very slow in progressing the gospel among the Asian community. We've got work to do. Know your numbers. So let's discuss another need that God showed me 20 years ago whenever I first started going over to India, and very specifically 10 years ago when I went full-time focused on Global Hope India. I went for a week of prayer and fasting there, and I really sensed God just impressing upon me to not recreate the will, but to come empower the pastors of of India. And just really impressing upon me that as a privileged white American, I could have an influence for the gospel, but I would never, ever be as effective as the indigenous leader. And so from from that moment all the way through, every one of our teams is trained to not have a spirit of entitlement over them and a, we know what's best for your church approach to ministry, but to realize we are there to learn, we're there to serve, and we are never there to replace the indigenous leader. So we want to strengthen them. We want to see them as the Moses of our day, and we come under them to lift their hands up in battle and to pray for them, to love them, to encourage them. And so part of the dream of living the dream is that the Church of America would really find partnership with foreign-born internationals like your parents. So this is a couple from Asia brought from Taiwan over to the USA. They've been strengthened for ministry here. They've, uh, and now they're in China for two decades now. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't surprise me. This is what I'm finding. Wendy from Campbell University comes from Vietnam and she and Nelson are about to marry in the next year. And they are looking to be medical missionaries in Asia Emmy and Jenny come from China. They find Christ here in the U.S., and now they're sending Bibles back to China. And so there's an opportunity to be more effective in the Great Commission as we reach the foreign-born internationals and then set them loose to the nations. 
I'd love for you to speak into that. There's got to be something that God's shown you as to why your parents are, are in China. Why, why not in North Carolina? It's not to say that God doesn't care about people in North Carolina, USA, Americans, but there is a, I'm witnessing a move of God of internationals coming here, receiving the gospel or being strengthened for the gospel, but then sent back to their people, sent back to Asia. One last thing before I let you talk, Dr. Billy Graham said, as India goes, all of Asia will go with her. And even in 1972, he said, if we can get the gospel to 1.3 billion, they will help us take the gospel to the 4.6 billion that come from Asian countries. What, what would you say about that strategy? For the Great Commission, what have you witnessed, or what's your conviction? It's a, it's a great, it's such a thoughtful question. You know, last year I had the chance to meet a gentleman who was brought to lunch, and um, by by a, a Christian coworker of mine, he said, "Hey, you got to meet this guy." And this guy, he was he used to work for the government, like in the CIA or something, as a linguist, Harvard trained, MIT trained, and here's God finally saying, "Okay, I think you're now ready to come into my service." So now he he was. Uh, so when I met him, he had just put in his resignation with his high level linguistic government job and was getting to go, uh, getting ready to go. Oh, boy, um, I forget the name of the ministry, but essentially they're translating the Bible into into the, the, the last known languages of the world. And as he was talking about why that was important, he gave the story about how there was a small tribe in Africa and, and they, they raised chickens. So not a huge population. But as they translated the gospel into their mother tongue and, and, and the words, you know, the parts of, of, of scripture that talks about how, you know, you will hide in the shadow of his wings. And they lit up and they said, hey, your God is our God, you know, because you know, we're, 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 we're a population of, of bird farmers, chicken farmers. And here he is, you know, talking about the imagery here is like, hey, I'm the God of the bird people, too. And, and that resonated so fast and, and spread so fat quickly throughout that community and that population, you know, and, and yeah, so it's, it's beautiful to see God being able to reach people where they're at, mm -hmm. right. In their own languages, in their own space, using, you know, using their own language to do it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think part of what you say kind of inspires me to one of the previous questions, which was, okay, the other, I guess the other thing that, that we as a church need to do different, I don't think Christians are very good at this, is we don't like change, right? Hey, this is the way we've always done it. Mm -hmm. This is safe. This is good. But, you know, when you bring a lot of people from lots of different cultures in, there will be change. Yeah. And that's not always bad. In mm -hmm. fact, that, you know, for, for some of the benefits that you mentioned, that is mm -hmm. so good. These are mm -hmm. people who have seen mm -hmm. true persecution. These are mm -hmm. people who have seen true life without the Lord, mm -hmm. you know, and, and a whole society without the Lord. And they appreciate it so much more and they worship so much mm -hmm. harder and they love so mm -hmm. much deeper. We just, we just need to be open, mm -hmm. you know, to, to, to what God would want to do differently. You know, right now I'm in the book of Mark. I'm teaching out of Mark chapter eight. And he just healed a blind guy by spitting in his eye mm -hmm. and then rubbing it. But whereas he could, you know, he, he's healed blindness so many different ways. So for mm -hmm. us to put God in a box and say, this is the only way to do it. Right. Right. That's, mm -hmm. you know, our God's the creator. Mm -hmm. He creates new methods all the time. Yeah. But yet still, I guess the balance there is to stay true to mm -hmm. the non-negotiable aspects of what God says in scripture we need to do. Well, you've described uh, in various portions the, the need to just set God free. Let God be who he says he is and let him do what he says he will do. And that's, that's ultimately what we desire for our lives individually as well as for the people of faith. The, the Big C Church globally uh, is just that there would be a spirit of freedom. And so with that, if your community's filling up with Indian nationals, uh, let the body of Christ uh, be free to go and build relationships with them. If there's people from Iraq and people from Afghanistan and uh, people from Muslim countries and Hindu countries and Buddhist countries coming into your community, uh, let there be freedom to go and welcome the foreigner and be a friend to the foreigner. Uh, we've talked on the podcast how powerful a simple smile can be how powerful just the willingness to have conversation can be and how useful it can be for uh, the gospel. Jenny sat here in our studio and shared a postal worker invited her 
to their Christmas dinner. And that was one of the first expressions of Christ in action. And Jenny's now a believer sending Bibles back to China. And it was a postal worker. And so we're not we're not here advocating that everyone go to seminary, get a Ph.D. and and how to advance the gospel. We just simply need to realize, even as I shared over you, that prayer of uh, that blessing of Abraham. We have been blessed. We have grown up in the Bible Belt, many of us, and we've been exposed to the gospel. We know that our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. How can we not go and share the grace that we've been shown, the love that we've been shown. And one of my biggest whys that I wrestle with God on a regular basis is why me? Why do I get to go to heaven and yet billion people in India don't yet have that opportunity? Why me? And and I, I long for the body of Christ to to just wrestle wrestle with that, with with gratitude, not with spite and uh, you know, yeah. um, but 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 in gratitude. You know, one of the aspects a, a different facet and perspective here. Mm-hmm. One of the aspects about the David and Goliath story that I've come to really appreciate in recent years is that whole scene when, when you know, David steps out and Goliath is just, you know, uttering curses on his God, on, on David's God. Mm-hmm. And David's response was so beautiful to me. And because he said, you know what? I don't care how much bigger you are than me. You know, you might you might kill me, but I am not going to let you talk about my God that mm-hmm. way. You and I did. You know, you and I, Goliath, we're going to go right now. Yeah. And he just, you know, he just loved his love for God was so much stronger than his fear mm. of the giant. Yeah. You know, and I've been trying to get myself to that place. And, oh. and, 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 and you know, it's because mm-hmm. once God has our heart and our love right, mm-hmm. and, and, and our complete trust, mm-hmm. anything, then, then he's free. Yeah. to do as he pleases and and you're right like we we can step out of the way a little more and a little more mm-hmm. and, and and just and just watch him do the amazing work and we get front row seats to that right? yeah before we wrap up the show i'd love to just allow you the opportunity to just speak a word of encouragement exhortation to the to the people of faith our brothers and sisters in christ around the world as it relates to this vision in john 7 every nation, every tribe, every tongue. What is God saying to you? What's, what, how's he pounding it in your heart? What would you say to the Big C Church today? Over the weekend, I've been thinking about 1 Corinthians 13 a lot, where mm-hmm. it just talks about how right, we can, we can speak with the tongues of angels. We can do so many things, everything right, but if we don't have love, we have nothing it comes back to that love for our Lord, love your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yes. And then love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. If we can just get those things, you said, those are the two most important things. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and it's hard, you know, if we, if we are honest with ourselves and if we peel back the layers, there are all these limitations we put on our ability to love God and love others and, and to continue to, to challenge that in ourselves. Because if we're going to reach a world about the goodness of Christ, what does mm-hmm. Scripture say? They'll know we are Christians by our love. Yeah, you know, as you're um, interesting as you were talking about supermarkets and 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 Indian Nationals family at my church, they have a 19 year old son who has special needs, mm. and he has had over 10,000 seizures in his life. Mm. And so, not a day goes by that he doesn't have seizures. Some more serious than others. Mm-hmm. And so, they've spent a lot of hours when they go shopping, you know, at the grocery stores, they have spent a lot of hours um, just sitting on the floor in an aisle waiting for the sun to wake up and recover from a seizure so that they can, they can get up and, and go. And they were remarking how actually it was, it's, it's the Indian folks who walk by that are the most compassionate, mm. you know, like it's mm-hmm. just so interesting to me, uh, yeah. you know, th- th- this big science, the social experiment as they spend lots of hours on the floors and the mm-hmm. aisles, you know, in supermarkets all around town, mm-hmm. you know, like it's, it's oftentimes. So they are Americans. They're Americans. Whites. Yeah. Whites. Yep. Okay. And what they're seeing is, compassion. is that the good Samaritan yeah. of yeah. our culture is the foreign born international. Yeah. The Indian nationals. Yeah, at least at the supermarkets, right? Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> it's great. What a what a good reminder, though, and a challenge to all of us to realize that there's many different varieties of opportunities to be that good Samaritan um, there. Yeah, 
what else you got for us? Anything else in final words? I really appreciate your time and and your podcast. I, I want to say one last thing. God's taken you out of the mold. I mean, because you are in corporate America. You you have had a very successful life and will continue to, but but you are morphing uh, into a pastoral role. And and I love that because often we can think that the the call to really have an outreach to foreign born internationals is for our paid staff of a church and those high ranking volunteers of a church and not necessarily for the average brother and sister in Christ. And, and you're, you're proving uh, that there is no box there. You, you can't have a ministry box and a, and, and a non-ministry box. Yeah. You know, and, and I had those box, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. I mm-hmm. love boxes to put stuff in, in my mind and structure. And, and God did crush that box for me by, mm-hmm. by having us start this home church and, and, and it's what we call, yo, know, not, we don't call it. Um, it's, it's kind of like Paul's model, the tent maker model where God mm-hmm. hasn't asked me to give up my day job. Mm-hmm. And so, but so therefore I don't have the, the, the luxury of a, a ton of time to just study and prepare for each message, mm-hmm. but that's where God shows up. That mm-hmm. is that reliance on the Holy spirit mm-hmm. that, that your friend was talking about, yeah. you know, and, and, and I need it every day. It's like, Lord, this whole thing falls apart very fast without you. Mm-hmm. And he is faithful week in and week out, you know, and I, as I do my best, mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's really all he asks, right? yeah. like, give your best and then leave the rest to him. And be okay with what he chooses to to do with it, Mm -hmm. you know. And as long as we keep loose fingers on that, and and to me, and I have to remind myself, myself as a small church, people, people come and go. We don't have all the programming that people are used to or accustomed to. And Mm -hmm. and but but God just asked me to teach His word and keep the doors open in my house. And if Mm -hmm. I'm, because at the end of the day, I serve an audience of one. Yes, right. Yeah. And so I just need to be sure I'm being faithful to to what He's asking. Yeah, I love that. And I look back over my life and I've had moments of really being called to that house church as well. And and even now uh, having been employed with a mega church and and being able to be on uh, volunteer teams with with mega church. But the New Testament church was house churches. And really one of the fastest growing segments of the body of Christ in India is among the house church movement. And uh, there's a place for both. It's not that they're in competition or in opposition together. Point is to, to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We need to be in community and we need to always have uh, an empty chair whether you're the mega church or either you're the house church, that empty chair that we're praying for those people that do not yet believe and be inviting them in. You know, and I would add, that's yeah. a great point. And I would also add too, like in this age of technology where it's so easy to say, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to stay in my pajamas. I'm going to mm-hmm. watch the webcast. I heard one pastor say, and it's so true to your point about do not forsake the gathering together mm-hmm. because as one pastor pointed to that scripture where Jesus said, wherever two or more of you are gathered in my name, yeah, right. I will mm-hmm. be there. So yeah, I can listen to a sermon on webcast and podcasts mm-hmm. and sometimes I have to, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a gathering together of believers, the, the, the face to face fellowship, right. Where when, when you get together two or more, at least Christ will be there. Yeah. And that's what we miss out on. If we just, where if our whole diet consists of not talking to other believers and just Mm -hmm. just watching from remote yeah thank you for that reminder isa thank you so much god bless you we'll be praying for you and your ministry i hope we can serve side by side around the world in the years to come that would be great that would be great i I would love to go visit india with you yes yes you heard that Uh, so Everyone keep Isa accountable to that. But obviously the invitation's there and by the grace of God, we'll be there very soon. God bless you, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much. We want to hear from you. I'm serious. We've set up a dedicated phone line to record your three-minute story at 817-66-DREAM. That's 817-66-DREAM. Pastor Kevin's been to India 50 times in 20 years. Where have you been and how many times? Let's celebrate going. Call 817-66-DREAM and leave your message. If we pick your message, we'll send you a free Living the Dream t-shirt. Check it out on our website. That's 817-66-DREAM. Call today. Thank you for listening to the Living the Dream podcast, empowering and equipping church staff with an identifiable and measurable strategy for reaching internationals and changing the world. 
You can help us live the dream by liking, commenting, subscribing to this podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And you can find more resources to empower and equip your church staff at globalhopeindia.org resources. That's globalhopeindia.org resources. <laughs>